Hello to our friends joining us on the recording. We are talking this week about lab lesson number two. So lab lesson number two covers three topics. We're going to start with a brief discussion of regional terms. Then we're going to move into a discussion of microscopy. And finally, we're going to round out with cytology. So microscopy is using the microscope. Cytology is studying cells. Regional terms kind of make sense on its own. We're talking about body regions. So let's briefly talk about body regions. When we are discussing body regions, it's more important to me that you know and understand how to use this picture than it is for, for me for you to know all the different words. So you've got a list of words on one page in your lab packet and a list of pictures on or a pic these two pictures on the other page. If you can find things on your body, if you can find them on the picture, you'll be able to describe them in words as well. So focus your time and energy on labeling things in the picture. Here's the good news about regional terms, especially coming off of quiz number one that included stuff about bone names. Many of the regional terms that we use to describe where things are in the body, their names come from the bones that are found there. So let's do uh, let's do some practice here. I have a region of the body that's right here in the middle of the chest. This region is named after the bone that I find right here. What's the name of the bone that lives here in the middle of the chest? Who lives here? We did lots of comparisons to it last week, didn't we? Yeah, some of us are starting to chime in. Absolutely. This bone here in the middle is called the sternum. It's the breastbone or the center of the chest. So the region that's right here around the sternum is called the sternal region. If we go to the back side of the body, so we're going to the opposite side here. The back side of the body along the middle is where we find all those bones that make up the spine. The bones that make up the spine are called the vertebrae. So this region right next to the vertebrae is the vertebral region. We had a note in our chat about the sacrum. That's my bone that I find right here at the end of the vertebrae. So this right here would be my sacral region. So as you're looking at the list of all the different regional terms that you need to know this week, if its name looks like one of those regional terms that we talked about, or one of those bones, excuse me, that we talked about last week, you're in luck. If you know what bone lives there, you can find where that region would be. I wanna do a quick review because my morning students mentioned that what got them on the quiz was medial and lateral. They got a little mixed up on the medial lateral words or uh, superficial and deep, some of those directional terms. So let's look at the regions we have here in the forearm and let's look at the regions we have down here in the leg, reminding ourselves with these medial and lateral words. When we look here in the forearm, the two bones that we find in this region are called the radius and the ulna. Those are my two bones here. So we've got the radial region and the ulnar region. When we're trying to figure out which is which, we need to remember which side the ulna is on and which side the radius is on. So let's say we're doing this medial one here. When I'm looking at the medial region, remember that medial means that it's closer to the middle. So here's my medial region uh, here on the pinky side of the hand. Was it the radius or the ulna that lived on the pinky side? Who lives on the pinky side, the medial side, if we're being technical? Yeah, exactly. This side is the ulna side. The way that Dr. Aulis remembers that is the ulna and the pinky are together. You've got the word up, UP, ulna, pinky. So the region that is medial on your forearm, whether we're on the front or the back, the medial side is the ulnar region because the ulna lives underneath. The lateral side 
the thumb side is where we would find the radius. So this is the radial region over here. When we go down into the leg, we also have the medial and lateral regions that we see here. And again, this comes from the names of the bones. So we've got a tibial region and a fibular region. When I talk about these two spaces, we'll call this number one and we'll call this number two. Would it be number one or number two that you would guess would be the tibial region? Number one or number two? Where do we think the tibia is? Do we remember? Yeah, several of us chiming in correctly that the tibia is the medial bone. So the tibia is the big one, kind of looks like a T. The fibula is the small one. Uh, the fibula is found on the outside of the leg. The tibia is found on, on the middle, on the inside. So medial side is our tibial region. Lateral side is our fibular region. Most of your regional terms, or a lot of them, are gonna come from bone names. Another group of them are going to come from those cavities that we talked about. So we've got this big region right here that refers to your entire chest area. When we were talking about the chest cavity as a whole, what was the name of the big cavity that was up here? It had the pleural cavity and the pericardial cavities inside of it. What was the big one up there? Yeah, several of us chiming in correctly. It was called the thoracic cavity. And since we know the thoracic cavity, we know that this region here, this big chest region, is the thoracic region. And down below it, we've got the abdominal region, just like we had that abdominal cavity. And we've got the pelvic region that's here by the pelvis. So we can use the names of bones, we can use body cavities to help us name things. There are going to be just a few others, though, that we can't really make predictions for uh, based on those things. So I'll highlight for you um, up here in the armpit area. This is a region called the axillary region. I'll type that in the chat for us faster than writing. The axillary region is your armpit region. So later in the semester, we'll talk about how we have a special kind of sweat glands in the axillary region that makes smelly sweat. Uh, so axillary region that we have up here. Uh, I'll also mention one that's a little bit tricky. Here on the side of the hip, where you have the hip joint, this is a region called the coxal region. Let me spell that one for you as well. Coxal region. The coxal region gets its name because technically those three hip bones you learned called the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, together the three of them are called os coxae. So the coxal region is the hip bone region that we see on either side of, of the hips. So you see in, let me get my pointer back here, you see in your packet a list of all of these regional terms all of these regional terms, even more, it, it never ends, right? I told you last week that there were some things that were good for making flashcards for. This is not one of those things because I don't want you to work so much on memorizing specific definitions of regional terms as much as I want you to work on finding them on yourself and finding them on the picture. So for example, I've got one right here that asks me about the forehead region. Well, the forehead region is right here on Dr. Aulis, same place on you. The forehead region gets its name from the bone that's found in the forehead. Who lives in the forehead? What bone is up here in the forehead? I know I'm getting your, your finger work out in today, right? I'm making you type stuff. Exactly, yep, the bone here that's in my forehead is called the frontal bone. 
Now, theoretically, you could make a flashcard that says location of the frontal region, and on the back side, it'd say forehead. Or if you know from the picture, or you know from touching your own frontal region that this is where it is, you could match it up with words. So big picture, what Dr. Allis is recommending. Make sure we can label all of these regions on our pictures, front side and back side. If you can label them on the pictures, if you can find them on yourself, you're going to be able to match up the names of those terms with where they're found. So I'm not going to take time on this. You do have pictures in the guided lessons to help you out with that. But again, really focus on the locations of them in a picture or on you as opposed to in, in written format. We're going to shift gears now and we're going to focus on microscopy and cytology, the two other big aspects of this week. So when I use this terminology microscopy, oh, I should pause. I apologize. Do we have any questions about regional terms? Let me let me pause for a moment. I should have stopped. So sorry. Yeah, Alyssa asked if I was foreshadowing uh, for exams. Consider most of what I say foreshadowing. Yes. So um, it's not that I would never ask you a, a question like that, like what's the location of the frontal region? But I'm more likely, since we're in a lab class, I'm more likely to use a picture. I mean, I might as well, right? It's, it's lab. So good question. And you all are in luck because your teacher is uh, one of a couple of teachers that kind of basically designed this course. So I know it inside and out. I got you covered. You're, you're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Any other questions about regional terms? Again, I apologize that I didn't pause sooner. All right, well, let's move on then into microscopy. So what we're probably going to spend the most time on in our lab class together is talking about how to use a microscope, uh, talking about the different parts of a microscope, the way that those parts function and what we use them for. We will also take some time at the end of our lab today to talk about cytology. So using parts of a cell figuring out what those parts look like, what they do. Uh, that'll actually be great review for you for our lecture class today. Part of what you were doing to prepare for lecture was reading about or watching that video about the different organelles inside a cell. So you're in luck. We're going to spend some lab time covering that same stuff to get you ready for lecture today. So as we get ready here to talk about microscopes, I'm going to walk you through labeling the parts of the microscope while I'm talking about them, I'm also going to tell you what we'd use them for. So make sure we get the labels down. If you can, write a few notes for yourself about what these different parts are doing, because you'll use that later to go back and match up the names of the parts with what they do. When you're looking at a microscope, when we are doing microscopes in lab, the, the first parts you're going to interact with are this tall part right here that's called the arm of the microscope, so what stands upright, and this flat part here at the bottom with its label here called the base of the microscope. So when we first go into the lab and we're doing microscopes, we will always transport the microscope using two hands, one underneath the base, one holding onto the arm. So the arm up top, the base down below. You get the microscope to your station, you're ready to start working with it first part that you're going to to look in or use is this part up here at the top. These are called the ocular lenses. So the ocular lenses are what we first look through when we're looking at a microscope. By themselves, the ocular lenses make things 10 times bigger. So you could actually pull an ocular off, you could peek through it, and it would make things by itself 10 times bigger. Now, 10 times bigger isn't necessarily super helpful. Um, because it's not big enough to see what we're looking for. So you will see uh, in a moment here, other things that magnify what you're looking at. We're using what's called a compound microscope. I'll type that word in the chat for us and it'll come up later. A compound microscope. 
meaning that more than one thing makes stuff look bigger. So the first thing that makes stuff look bigger is the oculars that we see right here. The second thing that makes things look bigger are these that we see over here. So these that we see over here are the things we call the objective lenses. Objective lenses each have their own name and they each have their own color. So let's start with the red objective lens. The red objective lens is also known as the scanning objective. The scanning objective is my lowest power objective. The scanning objective only makes things four times bigger. So by itself, it actually doesn't make things uh, even nearly as big as the oculars do. The scanning objective, the, the little one over here. Sometimes in lab, I'll tell you, okay, we're just gonna use red to look at, at this specimen. And if we're using red, we're using the scanning objective. Next to the scanning objective, the red one, you can see the yellow objective. The yellow objective is called the low power objective. The low power objective magnifies things 10 times just like the oculars did. So the low power objective with the yellow stripe, that's kind of my medium objective for, for our lab class. If we need things to be really big though, and when we're doing tissues in a couple of weeks, we need them to be really big. We're gonna use the blue objective over here, and the blue objective is called the high power objective. And the high power objective by itself makes things 40 times bigger. So the high power objective has the highest magnification of all three. So my scanning objective, the red one, four times bigger. My low power objective, the yellow one, 10 times bigger. My high power objective, the blue one, 40 times bigger. When you are looking at a specimen on a microscope slide, you're probably not just going to use one of these objectives. You probably need to go from the red objective, where we always start, into the yellow objective. And if it's something really small, we're gonna go all the way up to blue. Our ability to change what objective we're using is because of this part right here. This part that's holding the objectives is called the revolving nose piece. And the revolving nose piece, like its name says, has the ability to revolve or the ability to spin. So the revolving nose piece allows us to pick which of the objectives that we have in place. So again, when we're using a microscope, we'll start with the scanning objective, and then we'll probably at least go up to the low power, probably up to the high power as well. What we are looking at when we're using a microscope is gonna be a little glass thing called a slide. We put our slide on this big black part we see right here, and we see it over here as well, the big black part. This is called the mechanical stage. So the mechanical stage is this flat black part that we see here. This holds your slides. It has the ability to move up and down. We'll talk about how it does that in just a moment. But on the slide, on the mechanical stage, notice we have this, this silver metal thing right here. And you can see it just a little bit in this picture here from, from the front. This thing that we're looking at seen best over here is called the stage clip. And the stage clip holds your microscope slide in place. When it's moving up and down, or when I need to move my slide left to right, this clip is holding it in place. The way that I move my slide left and right, forward and backwards, is using this thing that hangs down right here. Uh, this is called the stage adjustment knob. So this moves slides left and right, forward and backwards, the stage adjustment knob. If I need the stage to move up or down, which is the way that I get things to focus, I'm gonna use the knobs over here on the right. So I've got this really big knob that's right next to the arm. This is called the course adjustment knob. And then I've got this littler knob that sticks out. That's the fine adjustment knob. And I'll mention, you can maybe see them a little bit better when we're looking at our microscope head on. See this part here that sticks out? That's our fine adjustment knob. And then this larger wheel that's right next to it, that's the course adjustment knob. These adjustment knobs help us to focus on specimens 
And the way that you focus them is by bringing them closer or farther away from the objectives. So the coarse adjustment knob moves the stage a lot. The fine adjustment knob moves it just a little bit. So when we need to fine tune what we're looking at, fine adjustment knob. When we're first trying to locate specimens, trying to get them in focus at all, coarse adjustment knob works. For you to be able to see things on a slide, we need to have a light source. So we can see over here on this picture, here's my light source. The amount of light that goes into your microscope slide is actually changed by a lot of different things. So here on the bottom is our light adjustment knob that we can see right here. So we have just a really crude way, a really fast, easy way to change how much light is getting into our microscope with this light adjustment knob here. That'll tell you how bright this light is. But then we can also use this thing we see right here. This thing uh, is called the iris diaphragm. The iris diaphragm will expand or contract to change the amount of that light that's coming from the bottom that we let in. So you can see on the iris diaphragm, there's this little lever conveniently called the iris diaphragm lever that we can push on backwards or forwards to open or close that iris. It's called the iris, just like the iris you have in your eyes. That's the colored part of your eyes. So we either open our iris really wide when there's not a lot of light, or we close it small when there is a lot of light to protect the inside of our eye. So regulating the amount of light that gets to our slide that's the iris diaphragm. Something we can't label in our picture because it's hard to see, but you still need to know about it. Up here, up higher than the iris diaphragm, but still below the stage, there's a thing called the condenser. I'm gonna type that name in for us, the condenser. So it's kind of hiding up above the iris diaphragm below the stage. The condenser is what takes whatever amount of light the iris diaphragm let in, and focuses it. So the condenser focuses light on the slides. The iris diaphragm controls how much light gets into the slide. Both of those things will impact the way that, that you view something on the slide. I believe we have labeled all of the parts. Do we have any questions or if you're tracking with me, send me a thumbs up or a smile or something. What was the part on the far left again? Are you asking about this one right here? I suspect. <laughs> yep. OK, so this one over here is the same as this one right here. It's the little clip that we see right here. So this is showing me the side view of the stage clip. So this is what I would press on. I would put my microscope slide right here but I press on this button to open it up so I can wedge my, my slide in there. Yeah, it's an awkward angle to, to figure out what that one is. Yeah, so stage clip there as well as over here. Got a couple of thumbs up and smiles. Perfect. Hey, I have to show you, I found this this morning. Let's see if I can find it fast. Here we go. Check out that emoji. If that's not legit, I don't know what is. I was pretty happy that they had that. All right. We have talked about most of the microscope parts. I'm not going to go through and match these with you. I'll mention these are not matched up, so don't frantically scribble because they're not correct. <laughs> Uh, but you have in the guided lesson a description of these parts, some websites to help you out. So please make sure to uh, to fill out the activity in your uh, in your packet that talks about their functions. I talked you through those functions while we were labeling things. Uh, Michael asked a good question if there was a reference copy in Canvas. Uh, there is not a copy for you to check your work, but that homework assignment that you can complete as many times as you want to, that's the best way to check your work. Uh, because you can complete that as many times as you want to, if there's one particular group of questions that you're really struggling with, 
you can go in and just do those questions like 20 times. And once you feel good about those things, then you can go back in and do the whole assignment. So what I mean by that is like if regional terms are breeze for you, OK, that's fine. But you're really struggling with the microscope stuff. Just go in and do the assignment three or four times just doing the microscope questions. When you feel confident about the microscope questions, then you can start doing the other questions too. So use that as your check. Um, besides the guided lesson, I don't have a filled in copy of the worksheet. Um, I just literally haven't made one. So um, that, that assignment is going to be your best bet. Uh, and Lisa asked a question about the videos. Um, I am posting them on my YouTube channel. Um, I am putting links to my YouTube channel in our Canvas site. You can also, if you look me up in the people area of our Canvas site, um, if you find Kathleen Aulis in there, part of my bio, I put a link to my YouTube channel. So that's where all these videos go. And there's a lot of other videos there as well to help you with your studying. All right. So let's talk about how we use our microscopes and then I'm actually going to walk you through uh, a virtual microscope to show you a little bit about how microscopy works. When you are using a microscope to help you focus on what you're trying to see, we're going to use both the coarse adjustment knob and the fine adjustment knob, but we use them at different times to do different things. So remember that uh, the coarse adjustment knob was the one that's closest to the arm. The fine adjustment knob was the one that stuck out. For you to decide which one you get to use comes down to which of the objectives you have pointing down. So let's talk about how that works. When I have the scanning objective in place, I can use both the coarse adjustment knob and the fine adjustment knob. Remind me, I'll, I'll re-say that statement in a moment, but remind me what color is the scanning objective? What color is the scanning objective? Because that'll help us to, to remember with these, uh, with these adjustment knobs. Exactly, yep, the scanning objective lens is the red lens. So the scanning objective lens, the red one, I somehow got muted. <laughs> I'm back now. We're good. So the scanning objective lens is teeny tiny and the scanning objective lens. We've got lots of space for the stage to move and not bump into it. So when the scanning objective lens is in place, the red one, you can use the coarse adjustment knob that moves the stage a bunch or you can use the fine adjustment knob that just barely moves the stage just to barely get it in focus. Once we move, though, to the low power objective. Once we start using that yellow objective, we can only use the fine adjustment knob. And that is an underlying highlight star idea. That's a really important idea. Once you put down the low power objective, you can only use the fine adjustment knob. The same applies for the high power objective, but it starts at the low power objective. Anything from there or stronger, we can only use the low power objective. The reason for that is a term that I'm going to use that picture from before to illustrate for you. So let me go to my picture here and get my pen. Depending on which objective I have pointing down, remember uh, that we've got this thing here called the revolving nose piece that's moving my objectives around. When I have, for example, the low power objective in place right now, this little area that I'm labeling right here, this is something called the working distance. I apologize, this looks real ugly. Working distance. The working distance is the amount of space between the objective lens and the stage. As I trade out my objective lenses, the size of my working distance changes. So when I have my smallest objective in place, when I have that scanning objective in place, I've got a big working distance. There's lots of space for the stage to move up and down. No big deal, I can use the course adjustment knob. But as soon as I go from the scanning objective to the low power objective, which is much longer, 
I suddenly have a lot less space between my mechanical stage and my objective. And it's almost scary when we put down that high power objective, it looks so close to the stage. So anytime my working distance is small, which is when yellow or blue are down, I can only use the fine adjustment knob. I can only use this one right here that sticks out. We will practice that when we're in lab together using our microscopes, but big picture, really important idea for us. It is only when the scanning objective is in place, that's the only time that you get to use the course adjustment knob. You can use both when the scanning objective is in place, but anybody else is only the fine objective. We can only use that one that moves it just a little bit. Yeah, Lisa asked a good question, an important question. She asked, is it possible to break a slide? Um, yes, it is. That is why it's so important that we make sure that uh, we're using the right adjustment knobs. So um, I don't ha usually have too much trouble with that, but we have a box in the front of the classroom where we collect all the broken slides that you know we accidentally used our course adjustment knob with the high power objective and it'll just snap that slide in half. So that is why it is important to know which one you're using uh, to make sure we don't break those slides. Great question. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is It is not fun and it is also uh, a, a, a not terribly expensive mistake, uh, but, but it is, you know, it still costs money to buy new slides. And so better to avoid that, put it that way. <laughs> When we are working with our microscopes, we, I mentioned this terminology before, and now it's back, so we'll talk about it a little bit more. We're gonna be using what are called compound microscopes. So when you have a compound microscope, we actually magnify things two times uh, because each of the things by itself doesn't make stuff big enough for us to be able to see it. So a compound microscope, first we magnify it using those oculars that we look through, and then you magnify it again with the objective that you have in place. I won't make you memorize too many numbers for this class, but one of the sets of numbers that I am going to make you memorize are the numbers you use to perform a total magnification calculation. So the total magnification is when I look at a cell, when I'm holding it versus when I look at it on a microscope, how much bigger is it? To help me determine that, I'm going to use the magnification of the oculars, which, spoiler alert, is always 10 times, all the time, our oculars magnify things 10 times bigger. Then you're going to multiply that by whatever objective you have in place. Now, remember when we were talking about the objectives that they each have a different magnification. So let's remind ourselves here, I've got my, my lenses listed at the top, the four times objective, that was the red one. So the scanning objective makes things four times bigger. That would be if it was working by itself. But the scanning objective is working with the ocular lens to also magnify things. So when I think about how much bigger something is when it's on my microscope uh, with the scanning objective in place, I would take 10 times four to give me a total magnification of 40 times. So for some of the types of tissue that we're gonna look in our class, making it 40 times bigger is big enough. Uh, when we're looking at bone tissue, for example, we can see things at 40 times bigger than normal. But for most of the stuff that we look at, it's gonna have to be more than just 40 times bigger. Maybe we need to put down the yellow objective or the low power objective. When I put down the low power objective, that by itself is another 10 times magnification. So now I've got 10 times from the ocular and 10 times from the objective, which means what I'm looking at is actually 100 times bigger. Now we're in business for a lot of our connective tissues, but when we're talking about what's called epithelial tissue, which is what you find on your skin, for example, we're gonna to have to go higher than even 100 times magnification. We're gonna to have to use that high power objective. The high power objective by itself makes things 40 times bigger. Hey, check this out. 
the total magnification with the ocular and the low power objective, that's the same amount that the high power one by itself does. So it's way more powerful. And when we're doing our calculation, the total magnification when that one's in place, 400 times bigger, 400 times bigger. For us to be able to see cells that are as small as uh, the ones in your skin, we got to make them 400 times bigger than real life. So I mentioned I don't make you do too many numbers in this class. These are numbers you do have to know. There are a couple of different ways you can memorize this. Number one, you can memorize the equation and use that to help you solve it. So if I know that it's always 10 times whatever objective is in place, I can calculate it. Or if you'd rather not have to do math on a quiz, I totally get it. You can just memorize these numbers that we see over here. Memorize my total magnifications. Either way, I'm promising you on the homework assignment and on quizzes, we will ask you for the total magnification of a specimen when we're using one of these different lenses. Let me pause for a moment and give you a chance to share any questions or thoughts that you have about this. Questions or thoughts? This is when I put the cricket in, right? We got the crickets. Hopefully that means we understand, uh, but as always, feel free to put something in the chat if you have a question. I, I promise I'm watching out of the corner of my eye, which is why I look so so twitchy, right? <laughs> I, I'm watching the chat. So uh, if something comes to you later, please feel free to, to put it in there. When we are, are talking about um, or what we use our microscopes for. We use them both to make things bigger, which is what magnification is, making things bigger. We also use them though to bring higher resolution. So resolution, if we're being technical with what resolution is, um, it's your ability to, to distinguish between two things as being different from one another. Um, but when we're thinking about it in terms of, of microscopes, honestly, the way I like to think about resolution is like, is it blurry or is it clear? We can see in our, our picture over here on the right that this is, if I started with this letter E right here, this is an E that, yes, it's magnified. It's, it's bigger than what we started with, but it is not clear. I can't see it clearly. Our goal when we're working with our microscopes is not only to make things bigger, but also to make them have very high resolution so that we can see them clearly. So the difference between magnification and resolution, if something is magnified, it's bigger, but if it is resolved, I can see it clearly. That's our goal, not just to make it bigger, but also to see it clearly. When we're looking at slides on our microscope, these slides are going to be 3D and different kinds of tissue especially will, will be really cut really thick. When we're talking about what you can focus on in your tissue, we're talking about something called the depth of field. So when we have a slide uh, like this one that we'll look at in lab, uh, this, this slide has three thin pieces of thread, literally three threads that are stacked one on top of each other. This is a three-dimensional slide. When I'm looking at this three-dimensional slide with my scanning objective, I have a really big depth of field. Think about it as like diving into a pool. So a really big depth of field means I can see all of the layers. They're all in focus at once. When my scanning objective is down, my depth of field is huge. I can see all of, of what's in here. But when I go up to the low power objective, when yellow starts to be in place, now I can't quite focus on all three parts of, of these threads because now my depth of field is not this big, now it's this big. And when I put down that blue objective, my depth of field is tiny. There's very little space inside my slide that I can focus on. So the depth of field is how much 3D space I can focus on inside the slide. As your magnification goes up, as we're making things bigger and bigger and bigger, 
the the depth that I can see them clearly gets smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where when we're looking at some of our types of connective tissue that have a lot of proteins on the outside of the cells, we might not be able to focus on all of the cells and all of the proteins at the same time. So the depth of field is how deep in my slide I can focus at once. If I have low magnification, I got a big depth of field. If I have high magnification, little depth of field. Uh-oh, Lisa says she's in a building that's having a fire alarm. Uh, Lisa, be safe. <laughs> Go ahead and evacuate your building. Join us back when, uh, when you're able to. So sorry that you're having a fire alarm. <laughs> Thankfully, I am not in my office. That would be the end of class, which I'm sure you would all be excited about, right? <laughs> now, we love anatomy, right? We want to stay here all day. That's my sarcastic voice, in case you couldn't hear it. <laughs> All right, so depth of field, how much of the slide we're focusing on. The other thing uh, that we should know about the way that we look at things is something called the field of view. The field of view is how wide on your slide you can see. So the depth of field is how far down into the slide we can go. The field of view is how much of the slide we can see. Now the field of view is important for you because depending on what magnification you're at, the size of your field of view goes from big to smaller to really small. So when I'm looking at something on the microscope, if my total magnification is 40 times, so if I've got my scanning objective in place, I can see a ton of space on my slide. See how here's the thing I'm gonna look at, this little dot here in the middle, but I've also got all of this space here in the outside. Well, when I put my next objective down, when I go up to my low power objective, notice that I zoomed in uh, on my spot and I'm not seeing quite as much of this outside area. And if we go all the way up to the high power objective, we can't see nearly as much of, of the stuff on the outside of, of that. So here's why this matters. When you are, are looking at a slide in class, you get the slide in focus, it's clear. Make sure that what you're looking for is in the middle of your field of view. So what I mean by that is maybe we're focused like this, but this is the part of your slide that's in the middle of what you're looking at when you look through the oculars. Well, when I go up to 100 times magnification, I'm gonna zoom in right here. So I'm gonna kind of make a bullseye around here, except what I was looking for was this. And if I zoom in really close over here, I'm not even gonna be able to see that. So make sure what you're looking for is in the center of your field of view. So field of view, everything that you can see. Depth of field, how deep you can focus on. One other term that we hadn't discussed yet that I wanna make sure to discuss for you is parfocal. In addition to our microscopes being compound microscopes, they are also parfocal microscopes. This means that I can start with the scanning objective, get it in, in focus, and then when I go to the low power objective, it will stay in focus, mostly. I'll have to use that fine adjustment knob to fix it, but it'll be mostly in focus already. And when I go up to the blue objective, it's the same deal. It'll be mostly in focus. So when you're considering um, what parfocal means, it's a really good thing for you because parfocal means that if I focus it once, I'm mostly good for it to be focused on all the other times. So parfocal microscopes saves you a little bit of trouble. We focus it once, then we just got to fine tune it from there. I'm about to pull up the virtual microscope. Give me a thumbs up or if there's something that you would like me to clarify before I do that, let me know in the chat. I'll grab my virtual microscope while we're considering. I like it, Hayden. <laughs> Perfect, okay. Lots of thumbs up, some smiley faces, good. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm pasting in the chat for you. 
the website that you should now see on my screen for a virtual microscope. So this virtual microscope looks a lot like the microscopes that are in our lab. So today I'm going to play around with one. Um, we're going to look at some things together and this will help prepare us for when we start looking or start using those microscopes ourselves. I will mention if you happen to be on Northeast campus at some point this week, we have a place called the Science Learning Center. The Science Learning Center has microscopes and they have slides. So you're welcome to stop into the Science Learning Center and start playing with a microscope to get some practice with focusing things or practice with finding things. They've got people there to help you out with that. Uh, so let me mention that the Science Learning Center is in a building called NHSC, the Health Sciences Building. Plan to stop by there sometime this week. If you have a chance, you can use their microscopes there. What we're gonna do today with our virtual microscope I'm going to go here on explore. We're going to play around with a couple of microscope slides just to see some of these ideas um, apply some of these ideas. So I'm going to click here on my slide box. And I'm going to start with just a generic letter E slide. So this is a slide that literally has the letter E on it. It looks a lot like that picture that we had, right? It's magnified, but there's no resolution. Notice that right now I'm using my scanning objective, my four times objective. When I have the scanning objective down, which knob or knobs can I use? Coarse or fine? When the scanning objective is in place, what kind of knobs can I use? Exactly. Yep. When my scanning objective is in place, I get to use both of my knobs. So I'm going to use my course adjustment knob to get it mostly in focus. Now I want you to watch something for me for a minute. I focus this, but I'm going to adjust my course knob some more. I want you to watch my mechanical stage right here. So take a look at this mechanical stage as I move my course adjustment knob. Would you say that moving the course adjustment knob, does that make the stage move a lot or a little? If I use the course adjustment knob, did the stage move a lot or a little? Yeah, several of us chiming in. We, you can see when you watch that stage, it moves a whole bunch when I use that course adjustment knob. And that's how it'll do in real life too, in our lab. You move that course adjustment knob and it's all gonna move. Now watch that stage for me. I'm gonna play with the fine adjustment knob as well. Notice how you can barely see it moving, if you can even see it at all. Like if Dr. Alice is honest, it's very hard to see movement, right? The fine adjustment knob doesn't move the stage very much. That's really important for us. Remember when that working distance is small, we do not want it moving all over the place like this, right? That was like where Lisa asked, can you break a slide? This course adjustment knob is how you break a slide. So I'm gonna use my course adjustment knob and my fine adjustment knob to get it in focus. Now that it's in focus, I'm gonna switch over to my low power objective. So notice that I have a new objective in place. It's pointing down on my slide. My working distance has gone down. They're closer to each other. Now that I have my low power objective in place, I cannot use this course focus knob anymore. This doesn't do a good job of showing it, but if you use the course adjustment knob on our microscopes, when you're with yellow or uh, blue uh, objective down, uh, it, you'll completely be, you won't be able to see anything anymore. It'll completely go out of focus. So. Not only do we need to make sure we don't break our slides, we also don't want to lose what we're looking at. So I'm in pretty good focus here. I'm happy with that because this is a par focal microscope. If anything needs to change, I'm gonna use that fine focus knob, go back and forth till I think it's perfect. All right, now I'm focused on yellow. I'm gonna go up to blue. Again, when I'm here on blue, I better not play with that course adjustment knob. I will break my slide but I can use that fine adjustment knob to get it as crisp as I want it to. I can also play around with, remember that light adjustment knob 
or that iris diaphragm lever, I can play around with those things as well. So we used these three objectives to look at the letter E slide. Let's look at a slide that actually applies to our class. That's actually, you know, like a human slide briefly. We're going to look at a blood smear. Today in class, we're going to review the fluids of the body. So when we're talking about your blood, your blood has fluid inside of it. That fluid is called plasma. So when I look at this slide here, I'm going to see some cells and those cells are going to be surrounded by clear plasma. So notice I've got a new slide on my virtual microscope and I have to start with the scanning objective. Every time you put a new slide on your microscope, you have to use the scanning objective first. So notice I put the slide on my scanning objective. I can't see anything. We are completely out of focus, but the scanning objectives in place. So I get to use the course adjustment knob. OK, I'm starting to see some stuff. It's getting a little clearer. Maybe I'll fine tune it a little bit. OK, that's probably as good as it's going to get with the low power objective in place or excuse me, with the scanning objective in place. Now I got to go to low power. So I bumped up. Notice my working distance is smaller now. We're closer. I better not use that course adjustment knob. I can only use my fine adjustment knob to make it a little bit crisper. And I'm going to go ahead and add some more light to see things a little better. But if I really want to see what's going on with the red blood cells, I'm going to have to go all the way up to my high power objective. And at that point, we definitely only use that fine adjustment knob, fill in with a little more light. Beautiful. So when we start playing around with our slides, here's the most important things to know. Number one, we always start with the scanning objective. Number two, when the low power or the high power are in place, you can only use the fine adjustment knob. Those two things coupled together will help you out a bunch when we're looking at, at tissues. I'll mention I got this question earlier today. What if I can't get it to focus on the high power objective? Well, then I'm going to tell you, OK, let's go back to the low power objective and make sure it's in focus on the low power objective. If I can't get it in focus on the low power objective, I got to go all the way back to the scanning objective. Because here's the deal with parfocal microscopes. If you're in focus the first time, you will stay in focus the whole way through. But if you're out of focus the first time, if I don't focus, oh, it's mad at me. Bear with me. I have to go through step by step. We never want to go straight from 40 down to four. Got to go through. If I didn't take the time to focus when I'm here on, on the scanning objective, I'm not going to be able to get it on the low power or the high power. So make sure that uh, you, you can focus it at the beginning and that will carry you through as you're working your way through. Lisa, I'm glad to hear that it's all clear over there in NTAB. Exciting times with fire alarms. <laughs> Any other microscope questions? Okay, well, let me briefly review with you how we'll store our microscopes at the end of our lab class, and then we're going to transition into talking about cytology, about our cells. When we are storing our microscope at the end of the lab, our goal is to keep it as safe as possible. Our microscopes are the most expensive thing we're going to use all semester, so we want to keep them intact. So when we're thinking about the end of a lab class, let's say we just finished looking at slides, we're ready to put away our microscopes. The first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to lower our stage, so it's not going to be raised as high as possible. It's going to be dropped as low as possible. So this statement is false. We'll use the course adjustment knob to roll that stage down as far as possible because I want there to be a big working distance. I don't want things to bump into each other. I want to make sure that I do not leave a slide in my slide clip. So I do want to take out any slides that are on my mechanical stage. 
I want to make sure that my scanning objective, my scanning objective, or my red one, is the one that's in place. By dropping the stage all the way down and having the tiniest objective in place, that gives me the greatest working distance so that nothing's going to bump into each other. Before I take my uh, unplug my microscope from my lab bench, I want to make sure I've turned it off. There's a power button on the side that's right next to the light adjustment knob. So yes, we do want to power it off before we unplug it. There is a special space in the arm of our microscope, the part that sticks up. That is where we will tuck in those cords. And as we walk it back over to the cabinet where they're all found in our classroom, we will definitely use two hands to make sure that we don't drop it. We'll stow our bags in our little cubbies so that we're not tripping over them, uh, but, but moving those microscopes, probably the, the most precarious thing we'll do all semester. Thankfully, we only have to do it, you know, once a lab class. It's not going back and forth. All right, with that, we are done with the microscopes. And I want to take a little jaunt with you. <laughs> Hayden says he'll use four hands. I like it. <laughs> All the hands, right? All hands on desk. Deck. <laughs> All right. Last thing for the day that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about cells, cytology. So when we look at the two types of cell models that we have in our lab, uh, we've got what you see on the left. Uh, that is, we, we call this our large cell model on the left and then the small cell model on the right. Some of the features or some of the organelles that we see in both of them look the same. Some of the organelles look different. So I'm going to work with you to label these organelles and tell you a little bit about what they do. After we've labeled the organelles and talked a little bit about what they do, I'm going to split us up into our groups and we'll complete our lab group work activity. So that's our goal for the rest of our class time today. We're going to learn about cells, do group work, and call it, call it a day. So the first organelle that I notice when I'm looking inside my cells is the biggest organelle, the one that makes us what we call eukaryotes. Uh, that's this big central organelle. So in this cell, it's white. And in this cell, we can see the, the light purple circle thing that we see right here. These organelles that, that we see here, the large ones in the cell, these are the nucleus. So the nucleus is the largest organelle in most of our cells. The nucleus is where we store your genetic information. Having a nucleus is what makes us different from bacteria. Bacteria have genetic information, but they don't have it inside this membrane enclosed nucleus. The other thing that we see inside the nucleus are these two spots. And these two spots are something called the nucleolus. The nucleolus. Think about the, the word nucleolus as little nucleus. So the nucleolus is inside the nucleus. The nucleolus is where I make things called ribosomes. And ribosomes are a type of organelle that we have in our cell. So when we're looking at this cell model, the big one, all these white spots are the ribosomes. When we're looking at the small cell model, it's these red spots that are the ribosomes. So we've got this nice conga line going on over here of the ribosomes. We don't really have any that we see that are free floating on this model, but you do see all these little white spots on the outside of this organelle here. So this organelle and any of the blue things that have white spots on the outside this is what we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the rough ER. So you can see that all over the place in this model. We've got it over here. We've got it over here. When I go to my other cell model, you can see all the little red dot ribosomes on the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We can see more of it down here and down here. Your cells have rough ER that are covered in ribosomes, but they also have what we can see really clearly here called the smooth ER. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is 
is the same kind of thing as the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It just doesn't have ribosomes on it. We can see it very well in my small cell model. All of these flat, light purple sacs that I see right here, the smooth ER. To be honest with you, I don't necessarily think that the large cell model has the smooth ER on it, uh, but some people say that this part right here where it's just blue and there's not those white spots, that's as close as we come to having smooth ER on this model. But to be frank, if I'm going to ask you about it on a quiz or a homework assignment, I'm going to ask you about it on this guy over here. So the smooth ER easiest to see on, on this model over here. It's the same thing as the rough ER, it just doesn't have the ribosomes. It doesn't have the spots. A couple of organelles that look the same across my two models, these orange ones that I see in various places, these orange ones that I see over here, and I also see them all over the place here. These are called the mitochondria. Mitochondria. Hey, every semester I ask my students what the mitochondria do, and they always tell me the exact same answer. So what did your ninth grade biology teacher have you memorize for what mitochondria are? Exactly. Yep, there it is. <laughs> Everybody's high school biology teacher says it's the powerhouse of the cell. And you're not wrong. It is. Uh, it does power the cell. But in college anatomy, when we talk about how we power the cell, we're talking about something called ATP. ATP. Wow, I wrote that so bad. I'm going to type it for you. <laughs> ATP. Think about ATP as the energy money for a cell. So uh, for a cell to do something that doesn't happen on its own, we have to use energy for it, and ATP is energy. So my mitochondria, the orange things that I see in both of my cell models, their anatomy description of what they do is they make ATP. They make energy for my cell. Another organelle that looks the same in both of my models is the pink one. So here is my large pink organelle right here. And I also have my pink organelle over here. These are called the Golgi apparatus, or sometimes you'll hear it called the Golgi body, same thing. The Golgi apparatus, uh, when you're comparing a cell to a city, a lot of times we'll say that the Golgi apparatus is the post office. So this receives things and sends them throughout the cell. It packages them or it modifies them. That's the job of the Golgi apparatus. And we see that in pink on both of our cell models. The one other organelle that I wanna point out for you are these little churros that I see right here. And these little licorice pieces that I see right here. Dr. Aulis loves to relate things to food. I'm just gonna be real. So my churros and my licorice that I see right here. These are what we call the centrioles, the centrioles. And these are gonna be really important next week when we start talking about the ways that cells divide. So cells use a process called mitosis to divide. Uh, the centrioles help them to pull their genetic information to two separate areas in the cell. So the centrioles, the churros, the licorice, uh, that's what divides the genetic information when a cell is doing mitosis. There are a couple of other organelles that are important inside our cells that we're not asking you to label, but you do need to make sure you know what they do. Uh, so one of those organelles is something called a lysosome. If I were to guess where the lysosomes are in my model, I would guess this but I'm telling you, I'm promising you 100%, I won't make you label them. I also can't spell them, apparently. Lysosome. Uh, lysosomes get rid of waste, or the way that your lab packet describes them is they do intracellular digestion. So when proteins are old and worn out, the lysosome will recycle them. Or when one of your mitochondria is dying, the lysosome will break it down, help you build another one. So lysosomes, Again, I'm not gonna ask you to label them, but you do need to know their function. Uh, the other organelle that you need to know its function that we're not, not labeling, the other major one I'll mention, is something called a peroxisome. I suspect this is a peroxisome, 
but again, I'm not going to ask you to label it because I can't tell for sure. When we talk about peroxisomes, they act as a detoxifier. So there's these things called free radicals that are chemicals when they get into your cell, they go to your DNA and they mess up your DNA. That's bad news for your cell. We need our genetic information intact. Peroxisomes help to get rid of those free radicals to keep your DNA safe. We have labeled almost everything that you need to label on our cell models. We have talked about the functions of most of these things, not everything, but most of these things that we see here on the matching. Use that guided lesson to help you fill in any that we have not completed together in our class time. But I also wanna pause for a moment to open the floor to any questions uh, about functions or about labeling. What questions do we have before we split up for our group activity? Signing our groups. Let me check my chat. Yeah, so Jaquandra asked about the lysosomes, and Hayden's absolutely right. Um, the job of, of lysosomes is, is to get rid of waste. Absolutely. They recycle things. They, they break it down. Um, we need our lysosomes to keep our cell from having toxic stuff build up all over the place. So love it. Trash compactor, getting rid of the waste. And Kayla's putting the question about the centrioles. Can we help out Kayla? What, what did I tell you mentioned that the centrioles are important for? Does anyone remember? That's a tricky one. I don't even know if that's actually on your list. Surely it is. Yep, exactly right. Lisa and Jaquan are both right on that. The centrioles are involved with, with cell division. So they're the things that are gonna pull apart your DNA. We'll talk about that next class, next lab class, when we talk about mitosis, dividing things apart. Yeah, so uh, Roxana is asking a clarifying question about lysosomes doing digestion, peroxisomes doing detox. Yes, that's correct. So we lysosomes digest things and break things down that aren't toxic to us but if we have too many proteins build up in our cells that can be deadly as well so they, they have similar functions but more when you think about lysosomes think about them kind of as general um, trash cleanup if you will peroxisomes are kind of like hazmat like stuff that's really bad for us we want to make sure uh, we, we get rid of with the peroxisomes stuff like proteins or stuff that we could digest and use those parts again that's more the function of our lysosomes so good clarifying question they do similar functions uh but peroxisomes like i said are kind of like hazmat whereas whereas the lysosomes are just kind of like general cleaning all right if you have questions still feel free to put those in to the chat I am going to put in the chat for us the link to our Google form for today's group work. Just like last week, only one person in your group needs to complete this activity, but for the sake of following along with each other, might not be a bad idea if everyone goes ahead and clicks on the link so you can see what the questions are on the assignment. I want to show you how you would be able to share your screen in your group. I know we had some trouble with that last time. So I'm gonna pull my window over here for you. Notice on my screen over here next to the leave button, there's a little white box. When you are in your group, that box is gonna have an up arrow on it. When you click on that up arrow, it's gonna give you the option to share your screen. So once you're in your group, 
click on the little white box that's next to the leave button. Click that you want to share your screen and it allow you to share with your group members. Again, only one person in your group has to submit your, your assignment for your whole group. Um, and once you've submitted it, we are done with, with our lecture stuff for the day.